You're watching Spotlight, a production of Culture in Maine, York's cultural showcase. I'm Carla Christopher, poet, publisher, and producer. Join me along with editor, musical guru, and video extraordinaire Jay Schmuck, plus wild outdoorsman and videographer, along with technical extraordinaire Cliff Kern, and all of our friends as we go behind the scenes and get into the underground of what's really going on in the arts and cultural amazing explorations that are happening in South Central Pennsylvania. You'll see everything from art to music to dance to theater and you'll also get to meet the people who really make it happen. Find out how and why along with some great studio performances, some amazing on-the-street footage. You'll also get the real story. And that's what we're here to shine a spotlight on. Let's go. So if people had told me years ago um, that I was going to, one, end up in Pennsylvania, or two, that I was going to end up loving jazz, I would not have believed either one. Jazz to me was the stuff that played in late night Cinemax movies, or it was that crazy music that sounded like too much drugs and too many late nights and it didn't make any sense. What is jazz? What makes jazz appeal to people the way it does? I'm Kirk Reese. I'm a jazz piano player and an educator. My name is Steve Michi. I play upright bass. My name is Jeff Stabley. My name is Ben Galise. I'm a vibraphonist. My name is Tim Warfield. I'm here at the Strand Capital Performing Arts Center in the studio, and we're here with our first Friday Jazz in the city. Uh, we've been doing this for five years. It runs from October to June. And this evening I'm uh, honored and blessed to be playing with Tim Warfield on saxophone, and Ben Galise on vibraphone, and Hassan Shakur on bass.
because of the upbeat, uh, which adds syncopation, which hopefully makes it danceable. If I, if I look out and no one's tapping their foot or nodding their head, I feel like I'm doing something wrong. And color, just adding color to the music. What's an upbeat? An upbeat is the, the opposite of the downbeat. So if this is the downbeat, the upbeat, tick, 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 which is what makes marches exciting, it's what makes polkas danceable, it's what makes punk music interesting, it's what makes hip hop, it's all about the upbeat. To me, jazz is beauty and chaos thrown together in musical form. I love jazz and it's the, it's the genre that I wish I could play. And I, I can't, I listen to it all the time and continue to learn from it. Um, and I can appreciate the various styles as well. It, it's one of the few genres that I can listen to that is challenging to me, but I still, I still enjoy it. There's some music that I find to be challenging that I just don't like, but I can enjoy jazz and be challenged by it at the same time. on somebody else's genius, you know. Jazz used to be, in the 40s, it was a popular music. Uh, the big band era and swing era. It was for dancing, for casual listening. And since then, it's become an art, a, a valid miracle art form. So you have all of these sort of little things that have gotten lost in translation of the 2015. We have all of these books, but none of them are really written by people that played the music like you don't have a John Coltrane book written by John Coltrane, a Miles Davis book written by Miles Davis, an Art Blakey book written by Art Blakey. So what happens is you don't get any of that information. That stuff that you have to be with a master who whispers it in your ear. And there aren't really many of those left, though at least not of that generation. So you definitely have people that know that information. People still play swing and Dixieland music, but really the hurdle that to be a modern musician, you have to play bebop music. You have to, to do what's called bop, which Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie originated, Thelonious Monk, and they set up this high standard that we as modern jazz musicians have to follow. You know, so it's a different, it's a completely different idea now with the music, the whole idea of swing which even that has been explained incorrectly because it's taught via a quarter note. Ching, ching, ka ching, ching, ka ching, but it's not, that's not. Somebody heard that and said that's what it was, but it's incorrect. It comes from an African 6-8. And if, you, if I sing an African 6-8 to a quarter note, you'll notice that the beat is different. So if you go ching, ching, ka ching, ching, ka ching, ching, ka ching, ching, ka ching, on a quarter note, it's, a little bit laborious because you're actually pulling down ching 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 whereas if you play off the African 6-8 which is exactly it does this it gives the beat a different attitude but swing bebop blues uh, would be the I think three of the predominant ones um, that would have been evident from the time of Louis Armstrong to the present not bebop but um, blues and swing, dance music. Um, I, I think those elements are uh, kind of essential to defining it as an idiom. Defining jazz as an idiom. Bebop being a newer style of playing, 
But uh, I think bebop, honestly, is one of the most important eras in jazz because it established it as a sophisticated, virtuosic art form. That's a long, rough, controversial story, but that, that literally has to do with, that was before jazz was of interest to society, our society. When jazz was illegit illegitimate music and classical was legit. So when you, you know, still some people say, I play legit, that's, I play classically. So there was that whole sort of dynamic that went along with it. And it wasn't, and when that was going on, it was very, very still much related uh, uh, to the African diaspora. So where rhythm and dance were synonymous. And once we got to the point when you had Charlie Parker who came out with bebop, and he's playing a lot of notes, like all of a sudden everybody got interested, like, oh, this is now something very interesting. And people started to define it. And the more it got defined, in my humble opinion, it started to become a painting numbers thing. You know, because basically what you're doing is you're trying to talk about somebody's, somebody else's concept without asking them, what did you, what is this you're doing? You know, maybe, I'm not going to say that everybody knew what they were doing, you know what I mean? But I'm not going to say that everybody actually got the opportunity to say what they were doing as well. I was a trombone player from the time I was nine until I well, still have one and still pull it once in a while, but I picked up electric bass as a senior in high school and upright bass when I was 21. I started playing music as a drummer and percussionist when I was a teenager. Uh, I started playing mallets maybe a year or two uh, into studying the drums. Jazz music uh, <laughs> is probably a bit more trite than one would think. It's, it's uh, first of all, the obvious is that that's what my parents listen to. So, in all honesty, I didn't really know that there was much music else that existed until I was about seven. <laughs> And I got a chance to listen to the radio because, you know, in my household, Thelonious Monk was being played, Sonny Rollins, Art Blakey, John Coltrane, Lee Morgan. And, and so I'm hearing this every day. In the very beginning, I was probably working about averaging three nights a week. And back in the 80s, we were only making about $50 a night, which you could get by on that in the 80s. Now it's almost double that, and I work average four nights a week all, all the time. I mean, a club pay is double that what it was back then. In the 80s, I began to find that I actually could. Um, it would have been the late 80s. Um, it just, it maybe divine providence to a degree, but I, I found that uh, I was getting calls for gigs. And um, it more or less found me the livelihood part of it. Uh, of course, it was an artistic expression thing, and there was a point in my life where I didn't really entertain it being an option for a livelihood. But uh, again, thanks to, I think, the, the spirit of this area. Um, the older musicians were hiring me. People like Steve Rudolph were calling me to cover gigs for him. Um, Steve, Amishi, and I worked uh, pretty regularly with some older musicians. And before I knew it, I was making a living as a jazz musician in central Pennsylvania. I can't even say I pursued it that aggressively. It just sort of happened. I think the source of everything is being a musician. That's the thing that... It's how I define myself, uh, and sometimes it's hard to leave uh, my family and my home on a, on a night to go out and play, but I can't imagine doing, living life without doing that. Uh, I also cherish teaching, and I'm very lucky to have uh, two che teaching jobs that coincide with each other, the college and the, and the IU. I made a decision that I wanted to play, and there were two things happening. The jazz music at that time just happened to work with my interests. I was a visual artist, and that's what I really wanted to do. Uh, I needed, I always felt better when I was able to kind of immerse myself in something where I could kind of express and create. That's number one. Uh, number two, 
I've always been in the fashion. And when I look at, I mean, I've been in the fashion seriously, probably since the age of 11. I got very, I was, I grew very early. I got hair on my face very early. My dad was giving me gentlemen's quarterlies when it was really a gentleman's quarterly, not this sort of jive commercial thing that it is now. I eventually got into playing jazz just because I started to hear people in my town playing jazz and there was a guy that played vibes, used to bring vibes out and I thought it was really awesome and I wanted to play vibes and I actually went to school to study classical percussion. I went to school in South Jersey at Rowan. I uh, went to study classical percussion at first, uh, but eventually switched to jazz, playing vibes, and kind of haven't turned back since. I didn't want to play the saxophone, I wanted to play drums. My mom said no, but when I got to the school, um, they started introducing me to instruments. I wanted to play all the instruments I equated to jazz. I want to play the bass, there was no bass. And no one said, we have to learn how to play violin first or something like that. I want to play the drums, but my mom said no, so that wasn't an option. And uh, um, I wanted to play the steel pan, because I used to listen to a lot of uh, 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 um, um, Caribbean music, right? Because my mom gave me this, this three record set of, of steel pan music from Trinidad, right? So I was listening to that, and I wanted to play that, and no one explained to me what that was supposed to be about, because when you start talking with, I mean, pretty much with, with uh, teachers, it's like, okay, we got these 15 instruments. We got 30 trumpets, but we only got two saxophonists. We need to push to make sure that we have enough saxophonists so that we can do, you know, do our job, which is have a band. So I played all the instruments. I couldn't get a sound out of any of them. And then the next meeting was, I can't remember when it was, maybe, maybe it was a couple of days later, they brought us into a cafeteria. And there was a saxophone, which I hadn't seen. It was the only instrument I could get a sound out of, so I played the saxophone. I've been fortunate. I mean, it was always something I knew I was going to do. I used to work for my dad, who was a brick mason, and I worked three years in high school during the summer and three full years after high school. And I did kind of enjoy being out, and I, I, I liked the labor, but I, I didn't love it enough to want to make a living doing that forever. And when I went to school, when I went to college, I wanted to be an architect because I thought that there was a greater, that there was a relation, a strong relation between visual art and architecture. Like I could kind of figure out a way to design, like there was a parallel between design. But the opportunity for creativity, number one, is not a great opportunity at all. Many times you're told what to do, you follow the instructions, get it done, get paid. And the other thing is that it involved a lot of mathematics, which I hate. If you were an architect, there are certain things you have to do for that building to comply with not only codes, but aesthetics as well. O was really a no-brainer, okay? Uh, mechanical drawing, F, uh, concert band, A, this is a no-brainer. So I just segue in college to jazz studies. I love everything I do. I, I really enjoy everything I do. But it is a time constraint, and there are times when today I'm carrying my bass drum down Philadelphia Street, and it kind of feels like you're in a parade, you know? It'd be nice to play in a place that had a drum set already set up, but but the hassle of that is, is, is beyond compensated by the fact that how joyous it is to play music together. You know, I'm lucky that I'm in an art form where I get to express myself and create, but I get to do it with three other people at the same time, and, and we inform each other with what we do. That's just more fun than I could possibly put into words. Uh, we have a Jazz Vespers service at First Prez, which I believe your show documented previously, uh, where we honor Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you.
first. Um, some people would say the swing feel because that sits behind 80% of what we do but not, not 100% so you couldn't specifically say that. Um, probably besides improvisation most important thing would be the fact that what we're doing is based on the history of those that came before us and the respect that we pay to them musically. People like Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Charlie Parker, and Dizzy Gillespie, and Thelonious Monk. Miles Davis, because Miles Davis was just Miles Davis, period. And he influenced a bunch of periods of music, like the cool period and the modal period. But he was Miles Davis. And when you say Miles Davis, like if I say Miles Davis to you, there'll probably be some sort of visual that you have in immediacy, because he was that. That's all I want to be. I'm not really interested in the other. I like the feeling of swinging music, jazz, has that triplet feel, which I like the swing, and I like Latin music, and I'm not a big fan of more pop styles, only because the bass lines tend to be fairly boring. There was a resurgence the last several years. When I was coming up, there was a resurgence the last several years. When, uh, uh, prior to that, there was a resurgence, and, and that's because we live concentrically. So, so, if jazz is not popular now, it will become more popular later, just as everything else, you know? Whether it be pointy shoes or wide shoes, or, or, or like now, I've got on a lot of more skinny, tailor-fitted clothing, but I know very matter-of-factly right now that they're starting to put together stuff. What's, what's starting to become popular in men's fashion is wider legs again, which I do not want to do. Wider legs with pleats. Yes, and big boxy shoulders. You know, exactly, exactly. But that's what is about to, I mean, I already see it quite a bit. And they're really trying to push that. And that's just what we do. So everybody's had conversations with their family when you come up with some new stuff and you're feeling good when you're younger and your mom or dad goes, oh, you all got your fab you wearing that now? Man, we wore those, but we wore those. There was a little buckle on the back of the pants and fastened with a little belt in the butt, blah, 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 blah. We called them blah, blah. What do y'all call it? Yeah, we called it such and such. It's the same thing. Same thing with the music. I mean, it sounds like a contradiction. As much as I'd see it, love to see it popular. I mean, I think to defining popularity versus people who appreciate the art form. To answer your question, I would have to say yes, because we've seen it before. We've seen it. We saw it with jazz and the swing era coming out of the music of Louis Armstrong and more artistic players. We saw it with rap music. Um, I, I think rap and its Advent was one of the, if not the purest musical art form, American musical art form since jazz, and with the commercialization of rap, I believe it's lost some of its authentic, authentic um, artistic integrity. Uh, so I think we've seen it with other genres as well. To answer your question, yes, I do think um, art forms flourish the most when they are on the fringes of the mainstream because they're allowed to. There's nothing to prove. There's no one to appease. That's how we, that's how we operate here in this country. I think that's really a bit of the energy of commercialism uh, that kind of touches our art forms where it's always about here's what's happening now. Whereas, I mean, how do you say that? Let's just talk about visual art, right? Like, how do you say that about, like, Picasso, 
Matisse, Renoir, Gauguin. Which one is happening now? They're all happening. You see what I'm saying? So, and that's how I feel about John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, Wynton Marsalis. It doesn't matter. It's like, it's all, they're all happening. Well, our perspective, whoever's giving us this information, is the problem is that we embrace the information. You know, when someone says, this is what we're doing now, the question is, who's we? I always ask that, because somebody came up with this idea individually, most likely. I'm so, a big fan of pop music. Uh, you know, I, listen, I, I, I don't listen to a lot of jazz, because for me, it's, a, it's, it's, it's work. I listen to hip-hop probably 90% of the time. <laughs> it's true. I'm very influenced by avant-garde music. I don't do it here much, but you can kind of hear it in my sound. And at sometimes, on occasion, I'll pull out something that's a little bit, or slightly out there. It'll be a little edgy, um, which is not what a lot of musicians do. So, you know, the guys that like to, that want to play with that sort of freedom, to say, man, I hope I get a chance to play with you, because they like to be able to do that, because a lot of the gigs are like background gigs here, background music, you know. But I just think it's a different type of motion. I think that even though we don't exist, I know we think we exist linearly. We define everything linearly. We don't. We exist concentric. But I and we teach linearly from this step to this step to this step to this step. So I I think that uh, uh, a lot of music when you hear it, it comes from that perspective. Real jazz is concentric as well because uh, 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 it's information that kind of starts like this and then opens up. And the reason why it's not perfect, like like perfect circles is because information is being passed back and forth, but it just opens slowly and wider and wider and wider because you're sharing information so many different ways. Right, uh, uh, but still, it has more of a, a linear motion as a result of the way the beat is played. You know, but since you're not playing that straight quarter note necessarily with, with um, avant-garde music, um, I like to look at it as, or compare it to the movement of the elements. Because there's a, sym a symmetry in the movement of the elements. People don't think so, but if you look at fire and watch how fire moves, it moves the same way that water moves and the same the way that wind moves in the leaves. You can't see it unless you're in the leaves. And that's like avant-garde music. It has that sort of a symmetry. It's different, it's more complex, but it's still there. There's still a, a very definitive motion that has this sort of a thing. It's like watching people dance like this, you know. It's just a different sort of a, it's just a different sort of a movement, but it's definitely there. And there, but there is abstract jazz. I mean, there is free jazz and, and a jazz without rules. Ornette Coleman, who recently passed, was one of the great originators of, of free jazz, where they got tired of being constricted by the rules of time and harmony and, and even melody and toss that aside and just truly improvise together. I that's a music with no melody. That's a cacophonous sound, and it's not for everybody. Everything that's happening in my head right now, the panic and everything and all the excitement and all the emotion that I'm feeling right now with being put on the spot like that, it's jazz in my head. Uh, and that's kind of what you have to live for, I think, as a jazz musician. I think, you know, when you're first really getting into jazz, I think you find those moments uh, frightening, but over time, you kind of embrace those moments because you realize that's what makes it what it is. Those unexpected things uh, turn into great things on the bandstand. So I think that as you keep evolving as a, as a jazz player, um, you, get, you tend to get better at that, and the frightening part of it becomes, you know, very liberating, actually. <laughs> well, I grew up in Lebanon, which is central Pennsylvania, and I do work in Philly a fairly fair amount, so I'm, I'm down there a lot. My wife is from California, and I, I considered moving there when just before we were married but I had already become somewhat established in central Pennsylvania at that time. People in Pennsylvania love their jazz. There's so much talent in this area and in Philly that I was really happy musically without needing to feel like I needed to go to New York to play with musicians in New York. Even during a drum solo, you could be 
socially aware of a concept and, and the, the, the idea of jazz is to play what's inside and express it so that other people can feel it like any other art form. And the, the more informed we are, that's what comes out when we play. So hip hop and and all and all that comes with that hopefully does come out when I play jazz, yes. You go to other countries, they're much more pre-oriented to the arts, generally speaking. There's a different level of value to what that is. So because they, they, they're exposed to it at such an early age, perfect example, I'm in France, I'm in Nice, and a kid comes up to me with these little red schoolboy glasses, I'll never forget. And this is when I actually could understand French a little bit better, because uh, I was still trying to, to maintain. But he basically asked me, who were my influences? And I looked at him, and because it's like, well, if I tell you who they are, I'm guessing it's, you're asking me this question, I guess it's because you'll know who I'm talking about. That's not a, the type of question you expect to hear from a, from a young person. But it's the nature of, of, of what they're taught at an earlier age. It's just a different value system. And so that makes all the difference in the world for every other country. I mean, we're still granting it over here. It's like, well, we're going to support this. We've got to write a grant, <laughs> you know. We'll know it's different when that changes, you know, if that changes. I don't know how to answer these jazz questions any more than I understand jazz, and it's making me nervous. Just like jazz does, I don't know. People clap in the middle of it, people yell, people know what to do, and I just sit there like, I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like I'm on a different planet when I get to see jazz. I'm so out of my element, I don't know how to act. I, I see lots of jazz that I really, really like. It definitely takes me to another place. And then there's certain jazz that is kind of like nails on a chalkboard to me personally. It's just kind of hard for me to listen to. So I'm here at the club, specifically the Holy Hound Tap Room, which is in downtown New York City, Pennsylvania. They're one of the few places that does jazz on a regular basis here in South Central PA. You feel it in your soul. I feel like a lot more than every other music. It's definitely a creative art form. I think it's a type of music that is living, it's alive, and evolving forward. Um, but I also think that it's a very specific musical dialect. Um, because not all forward evolving creative improvisational styles of music are jazz necessarily. Um, I, for me, I think true jazz has to have um, elements of the roots of the music evident in blues, bebop, swing. Um, and that's not to say that that's that we want to be Renaissance artists where we're playing nostalgic styles of music. But uh, for instance, our dear friend Tim Warfield, he's, uh, I use him as a, as a great example. He's authentically Tim, he's certainly a pioneer, he's certainly spontaneous and in the moment, yet in a given solo, you can hear the lineage of anyone, everyone from Wayne Shorter to Sidney Boucher, and yet he's a complete innovator and a un unique artist as Tim Warfield. It's actually the rules that define us in jazz, or, the, or that that hoop to jump through is what is what makes it all worth it. We we do what we do because the people did what they did before us, and we try to stand on their shoulders and, and keep moving the ball forward. That's what all art does, right? We we move the ball forward a little bit. We add our own perspective to it. If I ever thought that I was doing playing music that where I wasn't creating new things, I would, it would have no interest for me at all. So both as a writer and as a, even keeping time behind other musicians, almost on a, on a second to second, minute to minute basis, I'm trying to do, incorporate new things and, and express myself in a new way. That's the primary goal.
I think as musicians became more adventurous, the, the music followed. Um, even going back to the bebop era, they, when, when jazz moved out of the limelight as the mainstream popular music, musicians didn't have to appease dancers anymore. They didn't have to necessarily appease record producers and mass audiences. So they were free to explore the music for the sake of the art. And uh, it naturally became more adventurous, maybe a little more self-indulgent, which is a bad rap that jazz happens to get. Um, I do kind of date myself in, in feeling a little bit like the, uh, the current trend in improvisational music isn't really jazz at all. It doesn't mean it's bad music, but it really has, it doesn't have those elements of bebop, swing, and blues, um, much of it. And so that's, that's a debate I don't know that I've even decided in my own mind if, if even some of what I play really is jazz anymore. Rhythm is synonymous with dance. And if you don't have a dance sensibility in your playing, in, in, in your improvisations, if that's not there, your validity, I don't want to say validity because validity is about existence, but uh, the accuracy towards being a master playing the music will always be questionable no matter what anybody says about you. is like really dealing with the art of of the music like the art of what I do like that's the important part so that's when I do recordings that's the goal for it to be like okay this is a work and you got it and that's done and it's documented it's a moment in space and time that's where he was then and I go on to the next thing but I wanted to I wanted to I wanted to sound like that I wanted to, I want you to feel it I want it to feel like that and I want it to look like that as well that's logical like this is a product like that's what you know people listen to recordings for enjoyment but recordings are, 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 are parallel to like photographs or movies or videos it's really an idea that's been documented it's like a, a moment in space and time you know Photograph is real short, a movie is longer, but it's still like this is what it was at this moment. It cannot be this way in the next moment. And so when you understand that you have a certain control over that, then you want that to be as accurate as possible. So, okay, I will say yeah, I'm a little bit of perfectionist. Like Coltrane's Interstellar Space album, which even some other jazz musicians did not understand, I can, I can see something in that in that record that um, I can identify with. It's, it's, so, it's just so chaotic, but at the same time so representative of, of this crazy universe we live in.
Ulysses Crockett magic. Some vibes and xylophone and, and cool melodic percussion from the 60s and the 70s uh, when he was first playing in big clubs out on the West Coast. And I had to admit they were beautiful. I've seen um, some of the most left brain people get the bug and, and just totally pursue jazz. It would probably be a little more your right brain kind of creative free spirits who gravitate to uh, this kind of music, but I've seen all kinds. And I, I, conversely, I've seen students who I swore were gonna be jazz musicians who ultimately abandoned it after a certain point, found it wasn't for them. It's about creating this intimate vibe, almost like you're eavesdropping on the musicians. You're catching them doing something that's naughty, you know, that their music instructor wouldn't like them doing. And the audience wants to be in on that. They want to be looking and smiling and vibing on the music as if nobody was watching them. It's, I don't know, it's hard to describe. Kind of like the definition of jazz. But at the club we are. The meaning of jazz is... There's so many different schools. I mean, there's arguments among the schools of thought with regards to jazz. So, I'm not even gonna do that because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And I like all of it, to be honest. There's modern jazz, there's more traditional jazz, there's what they call traditional jazz, which was Dixieland and earlier, and there's just so many different styles, even within what we consider to be modern jazz. That all I can say is that I like all of it. I mean, honestly, for me, it's like bitches brew. That's my that's my jazz, and I make Jay play it on final nights. We actually close final night one night with bitches brew. And there's so many differences. Um, I mean, there's also a lot of similarities. Uh, in the way, you know, like a lot of rules that work for classical music, I think, uh, go into playing jazz. Like, I think with having a classical background, it's great because it teaches you to uh, get really refined on your instrument, and you learn your instrument at a high level, and playing with good phrasing and lyrically and getting a good sound on the instrument. And I think a lot of those principles carry over into playing jazz. I mean, those things are just universal. But I think the main difference is, aside from improvisation, I mean, a lot of it's uh, like a mindset, like just living in the moment. Um, I think that classical, you know what's going to happen. Whereas jazz, it's better not to know what's going to happen. And so you have to try to approach jazz in a, in a way that's, I mean, it's the complete opposite. Although even in classical, they say to uh, approach a piece as if you're improvising it, which is kind of interesting, to make it seem spontaneous. So it's funny how, I guess, they each kind of feed into each other a little bit. Because you still have enough people on the scene who have information who are sharing. So there are definitely some guys that can play. But, you know, you listen to people, and it's like, well, can they play the blues? Can they play a ballad? Like, there were some really important, dire, uh, like, dire important uh, ideas about playing jazz music that had to be mastered before you can consider to be uh, bona fide. And one of them would be like playing a ballad, you know? They talk about playing uh, or improvising. We talk about telling a story as opposed to, as we say now, nailing the changes accurately. You can nail the changes accurately and say nothing. It might be uh, impressive in terms of pyrotechnique, but the bottom line is that's a different aesthetic. That's something you see in another aesthetic. You know, but we don't have to necessarily do that. You know, we can go. And that's just as profound as going. You know, you don't have to do that.
story short, one of the things that I've noticed is that the music uh, started to be defined more in classical terms, explained more in classical terms, and presented more in classical terms. Part of it was economic. They couldn't afford the big bands anymore, so the role of the instruments were changed. But another part of it which is how you're supposed to act and how you should respond to what's going on as well uh, as an audience member. And different people had different ideas about that based off of their own cultural experiences. So if you go to Japan, there's nothing. Unless you just have to get in one of those special places. You know what I mean? But normally there's nothing until your solo is done or there's nothing until the song is over.
uh, there's really a, a desire to see the next generation take the baton and keep jazz and, and culture in general, arts in general, alive in Central PA. So it's a it's much more of a nurturing scene. I've even found like if uh, I visit a jam session, even as nearby as Philadelphia, that uh, there's a little bit more of a competitive spirit in in those uh, in that demographic. Um, but around here, it, I, I think it's predominantly about getting people the community and unity and getting the, the fledgling and the veteran virtuoso on the, the same stage making music um, together. My name is Carla and I'm a South Central Pennsylvanian and I just love jazz. It's home and, and uh, um, I truly love Central PA. That's kind of heavy. Thanks for joining us on another amazing episode of Spotlight, a production of Culture in Maine, York's cultural showcase. We want to hear your ideas and we want you to be a part of the show. Whether you're an artist or a fan, send us an email to cultureinmaine at gmail.com. Check us out on the web at wrct.tv or make sure to find all of our past episodes on YouTube at youtube.com backslash White Rose Community TV. Thanks again for joining us and have a great week. We'll see you soon right here on the corner of Culture and Me. Now you know where no comes from.